Hello and welcome. Director and screenwriter Oliver Stone has become one of Hollywood's most controversial figures. His unapologetic, passionate political views, confrontational approach to storytelling and choice of topics have drawn significant criticism from across the movie world and political spectrums. And simultaneously, applause, wide admiration and three Oscars. A Vietnam veteran, Stone's films have included Platoon, Wall Street, Talk Radio, JFK, Savages and Natural Born Killers, to name just a few. In recent years, his TV interviews with Fidel Castro and mass murderer Vladimir Putin shocked and angered millions around the world. One of his earliest films to trigger controversy was his political thriller Salvador, starring James Woods and Jim Belushi. It was based on the true story of a journalist's struggle to rescue his girlfriend amidst the 1980 bloody revolution in the tiny nation of El Salvador and involving the CIA. Stone ran into all sorts of obstacles making the movie and it was eventually shot in Mexico. I spoke to him shortly after the film was released and began by asking about how and why he chose filmmaking as a career and then his challenges making Salvador. Now, uh, first, before we get on to this particular film, can we go back a little bit in your career? Um, you, you, of course, served in Vietnam. Right. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? In fact, could, could we go back perhaps before that? I mean, ha did you have any involvement or inclination to be involved in film prior to, uh, to going into the Army and serving there? No, I, I hadn't. I, I, I came from the East Coast, essentially, of America. And I had no business, people who write, I didn't know anybody in the movie business, and it was not a business that people went into. Right. It was not a business. Uh, it was, you know, something that the gods sort of sent down. Uh, I actually had written some, I'd written a book that had been unpublished before I went into the Army. I was a young writer uh, who was sort of frustrated. And uh, after the Army, I uh, drifted around for a while. Um, had the usual amount of problems that returned <laughs> as a result of that war and uh, ended up at New York University uh, Film School in New York. By chance or by deliberate? Uh... Well, half chance, half deliberate. Uh, I drifted into it. I wanted to continue writing and I had done a lot of uh, 35 millimeter still camera work in Vietnam. Oh, right. Uh, Just purely for love or? Uh... Purely out of, yeah, the love of the... the, uh, the the, uh, the country, the light in Vietnam, I would say, is quite extraordinary. And uh, uh, then I got into some Super 8 when I got back, and uh, we got to, I got to make uh, three or four short films at NYU on 16mm. Right. And uh, also Marty Scorsese was one of my teachers, oddly enough, and that motivated me uh, to a large degree because of his energy levels. Uh, and uh, well, then after after New York University took several years to to uh, get into the business because it was not a time in which the business was open to young people as it is now. Mm. It was a older business at that point in time. So I struggled for several years as a road screen plays, but I couldn't get to direct. Uh, Did you have any of those screen plays produced? No, none of them were produced. Uh, I think I wrote twelve. Mm. It was a rather difficult time. That must be extremely frustrating. Yeah, it was, because I couldn't even get them read. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it was like, you know, they were returned unopened, and uh, I couldn't get an agent. It was very frustrating. Was, uh, I mean, looking back at those 12 screenplays, uh, uh, do any of them deserve uh, being produced now? Um... Well, uh, one of them became a film I just did called Platoon, uh, which I just finished. Right. Uh, which I wrote in 1976. So that was the 12th one, I believe. Uh, of the other 11, one was done uh, as a low-budget horror film, which I directed in 1973. Right. What was that called? Very little money in Canada. It was called Seizure. Right. And it was uh, sort of buried in distribution. Right. Uh, of the other ten, uh, none were done. Uh, I would, th I think about of them all. I'd say about one or two are possibly valid today. Right. Okay. We might, I might come back and talk to you a little bit about, about platoon because I understand there was some controversy over that. 
Yes, there was. Okay, well, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Can I just go back, though? Um, your experience in Vietnam, I mean, what, what sort of what sort of lingering... Uh, well, well, firstly, let me ask you, how did you come away from Vietnam in terms of attitude, and, and what sort of attitudes do you have now about it and America's role there? That's a long question. <laughs> uh, I essentially uh, went in fairly to the right politically, believing that what we were doing there was correct. Uh, I was wounded twice. I saw a lot of combat. Didn't understand what was going on. Uh, served in four different units. Got out after in '68. Was not uh, against the war. It was a uh, was sort of. I I came back a bit of a, a some problems. Uh, I would say, for want of a better word, I guess I was in the blur for several years. Well, when you say problems, though, what sort of problems? Well, uh, you know, drug problems over there. Mm. And, uh, what were you doing? Were you doing everything, were you? Not, well, not to the degree of a lot of people, but uh, there were lingering problems. Uh, problems with my parents, problems with society. H how, long were you, uh, how long were you in Vietnam for and how old were you when you came back? I was 21 when I got, got there and 22 when I got back as a soldier. I was there twice. I was there in 65. So, long story. I was there at the age of 19. I was teaching school originally. Mm. And I went back in the infantry. My God. And so what, I mean, what sort of drugs were most accessible there for you at that time? The usual marijuana and stuff. But any of the heavier stuff? No. So there's no heroin? No. Right. And then and what, when you say you came back with problems then with, from drugs, I mean, was it simply that you were relying on drugs to carry you through or...? Uh, well, no, I mean, uh, I, you, you'd have to read about it, John, and, the, you know, there's a lot of problems in that war. I, I really don't... I'd rather discuss that with you in person. You, know? mm. Mm. Uh, you, you obviously do find it difficult to talk about. Well, on an international phone call. <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, no, it was, uh, it was, it was, I, I, did, I don't know if you in Australia, you guys know what went on here, but, uh... There was a lot of civil war in this country. Oh, yeah, sure. We had it here. Don't worry. And, yeah, I went to Australia, as a matter of fact, three times on R&R. &R, or two times on R&R. &R, uh, to I, Sydney? That's another story. Yeah, in Sydney. <laughs> Dropped a little acid over there, too. <laughs> uh, no, we, uh, there was a lot of civil war in this country and a lot of protest and a lot of problems. And I came... I suppose it took me several years to uh, I, 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 to feel like the, the war had been a, a, a very wrong thing. Mm. But it was not an immediate turnaround. Mm. And how do you feel now about it? But it was a bookend to uh, this Central American situation that I uh, explored in Salvador. That it was a bookend? my life, in terms of my life, it's a bookend in, in so far as it deals with, I mean, we're dealing with the same issues 20 years later yes. that we dealt with in 65, which is essentially uh, intervention and military, militarism and a form of imperialism. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't heard the phrase bookend, so I'm a little, I mean, I know what it is, I know, I know what a bookend is, but I apply it in this context. Well, I mean, the, the, that war was marked the beginning for me of my youth, and what I just have seen, and what's going on now in Central America is, and that movie Salvador is like a bookend. I mean, Salvador, Vietnam uh, platoon is 65, and Salvador is 85. Mm. You know what I'm trying to say? Mm. Mm. So just let me deal a little bit then in, in more specific detail about your attitude towards... Uh, towards Reagan's policies um, uh, about uh, Central America. What, how do you feel about them? I mean, is there any justification to what he's doing? Not in my opinion, no. I, 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 I think the, his, his sense of values is totally distorted. Uh, By what? Well, I think that he's supporting the uh, military mafia in Salvador, as well as in uh, Nicaragua, and uh, in the name of anti-communism. And uh, he's opened up, uh, I mean, he's essentially repressed a revolution in Salvador. 
and it's my belief that our Constitution is for revolution and for self-determination. That's what we fought for mm. 200 years ago, and I think it's been violated by his policy. Mm. Uh, how serious do you think the uh, threat of communism is in uh, in Salvador? Uh, I don't think it's serious at all. I think that that's a catch-all phrase that people use in the, in the way that McCarthy used in the 1950s. Mm. How much is the uh, how much is the military economy of America involved in uh, in this? In terms of sustaining it, I mean. Well, the figures in Salvador are 1.7 billion in five years. In Nicaragua, as you know, it's it's much less money, but it's con it's been uh, con uh, contra it's been funneled secretly. Uh, there's also a lot of money going into Honduras and the militarization there. Mm. Costa Rica. Mm. And it's one, what, what did you say? 1.7 billion has gone to... into Salvador and military and economic aid since 1979. Mm. Salvador is the fifth largest recipient of military aid after, I think, Israel and Greece and Turkey and another country, Egypt. Mm. I mean, this is a tiny country. Look at the size of it. What is the population of Salvador? Well, it was approximately 4.5 million, I believe. It's about the size of Massachusetts. Mm. And, uh, I mean, they, uh, it's been a genocide. It's almost equivalent to the Cambodian thing in terms of death squad uh, killings of about 30 to 15,000. 500, 300 to 500,000 are estimated to be in the United States having left the country and our illegal aliens here fled the war. Mm. Uh, the situation continues, I think, to be stagnant and very and uncovered by the press. By the by the press in America or the press? By, well, by the American press. I can't speak for Australian press. Mm, mm. You, you at some point, though, were going to shoot the film in Salvador. We tried. We had some problems. Uh, we had to pull out. The situation worsened considerably in March of 1986. Excuse me, in March of 1985, when uh, our military liaison was killed and various Americans were killed. W was that a deliberate shooting, do you think? Which one? Uh, the one of your military li liaison. Oh, yes, definitely. Not, for, not because of the film, but because he was a target. Right. For various reasons. I, I just find, I mean, how, how did you expect to go uh, shooting the film uh, in there, which was going to be critical of the government? Uh, I wasn't critical. We had a script that was, you see, we were going to shoot half of it. Uh, in Salvador, and the other, the last half showing the other side's point of view uh, in Mexico and Nicaragua. Right. We were, uh, what we wanted to use the military government for there was the uh, ammunition, mean, was the helicopters and the uh, you know huge amount of armaments that they had. We wanted to photograph that. Mm. So we wanted to show them in combat, stage a series of combats where we told them they'd be winning, they'd be wiping out the rebels. <laughs> mm. And then we were, which they did, and, we, and then we were going to show the other side. It was a scheme that almost worked, as I said, but it just mm. didn't quite pull it off. We ended up doing the whole film in Mexico, and uh, without any interference from the government there. Mm. Mm. It is, uh, I mean, looking back, d don't you think it was an extremely, extremely dangerous uh, thing that you were thinking of doing? No, I think it was a daring thing. Uh, we had nothing to lose. We had cut off, well, cut all our ties to uh, the Hollywood system, so to speak. We were out there on the limb with very little money. Uh, it would have been a tremendous coup if we pulled it off. When you say you'd cut all your ties to Hollywood, in what sense do you mean? Well, the film was not uh, in any way supported by uh, American companies. Mm. It was viewed as essentially <laughs> radical anarchic. Mm. And, uh, was it? What did? Anti-American. And, and you were you were told this by Hollywood executives? Yes. What, what were some of the things they said to you? They said this is uh, hostile anti-Americanism. Uh, this is absolute rubbish. Uh, uh, the usual, you know. I've been through this before. I mean, when I wrote Platoon about Vietnam, uh, uh, about my own experiences in the jungle, I was told this was bullshit. Mm. Too harsh, too realistic, and too difficult for an American audience to sit through. Mm. 
When, when those those uh, those people who were telling you, those Hollywood executives who were telling, I presume they were they were major studio executives, were they? Right. Uh, when they were saying to you that um, that this is um, this is all bullshit and so on, were they in fact saying, um, look, it may be true, but we just don't want to show it, or would they not accept that it was true at all? Well, there were two different schools. One would be the the school that it was not true, which a lot of critics in America incidentally shared. The New York Times dismissed the picture as pure propaganda. Uh, <laughs> they ought to know. The guy who wrote it, this is supposedly a liberal newspaper. This is supposedly a new, liberal newspaper. It isn't anymore. Uh, the guy who wrote the review had come from the William Buckley New Republic uh, School of Journalism, and it was a, and is a neoconservative. So the, his name was Walter Goodman. So I mean, we didn't have a shot. I mean, that really hurt the movie a lot in New York. Mm. Uh, I mean, we got that kind of criticism, and then the other side of it was, if it is true, who's going to sit there and want to see it? Mm. Because Americans don't give a rat's fuck about, uh, excuse me, a rat's ass about uh, about uh, the situation in Central America, which they don't. The Americans. A lot of ambiguity here. Mr. Reagan is a great communicator, and he sold the notion that the uh, uh, communist forces are coming, are creeping up through Central America, and a large part of the American public has bought it. Mm. Uh, the aware minority is very anti the war, uh, the possibility of a war, and is demonstrating. And uh, it has the nascent ferocity of the early Vietnam protests. Mm. The when you were actually making the film in Mexico, did you? Uh did you run into any direct or indirect, uh, how can I describe it, interference? No, we had censorship. Any mention of Mexico had to be removed from the movie. And essentially, they tried to, uh, they didn't want any too much, uh, they were a little sensitive about the stereotyping of Latin culture, such as scenes of too many whores in, in a bordello, or scenes of too much litter in the streets. They were, uh, I also, uh, I think the scene where I had a lot of the corpses on the mountain at El Playon, they wanted me to cut down the number of corpses. Right. But uh, essentially they left us alone and we always bargained our way around things. They, Mexico, as you know, is a member of the Conador process and is much more, uh, and is, it differs greatly from the United States in its view of the situation in El Salvador. Mm -hmm. And it, it has been a home to, at least was a home until Mr. Reagan kicked him out of, uh, was a home to uh, various leftist groups there. Mm. I can see, I can see the way Reagan's going. He's going to have to invade Mexico and make it the 53rd second or whatever it is state of, of America. You might do that to Australia if you don't get your wheat down. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I shouldn't laugh about that actually. Um, I, when I was at... Uh, I, I think New Zealand has got him angry. Yeah, New Zealand certainly got him upset. Yes. Um, when, now, when I was asking about the uh, possible interference, direct or indirect, I was really thinking about uh, American interference. I mean, were there any 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 uh, efforts at all to try and uh, upset your uh, efforts to bring this film to the screen? No, uh, we've had uh, freedom of expression in this country. Mm. There's still a bill of rights, I, I hope. <laughs> there is. We were never interfered with. Uh, commercially, we had setbacks. We never were able to get distribution. Mm. Uh, distribution that we needed for the movie. Who, who picked it up in the end for America? Well, the same company that produced it, the British company, Hemdale. Right. So it was really uh, essentially British and European and Mexican money. Mm. They distributed the movie very, I'd say, haphazardly in this country. Mm. It played very well in certain cities. It, it lasted a long time in Los Angeles and Washington. Uh, it played six months in Los Angeles. Was it was enormously successful. Was, it, was there any political backlash once it did open? From various critics, yes. Certain critics, as I said, were, who are of a conservative bent, did not like the movie. Mm. Uh, other critics who were of a more liberal bent uh, were, went wild about the movie. Allowing that it is, um, I mean, that it is based on fact, that it, and, and in fact there are, you know, based on real characters and so on, and yet at the same time, uh, it, it is... How can I describe it? No, it's not a docudrama, but it is a work of fiction as such. Um, how how much of the film is absolutely honest, real, and and uh, part of history? Well, I mean, all the facts are real. Romero was killed. The nuns were killed. 
Um, um, Richard Boyle was there seven times. He had an affair with a Maria, whose brother was head was cut off by the death squad. He was chased. Uh, he went to the press conference where Major Max, Major De Besson, and uh, was had his camera broken there and was chased out by the thugs. He was chased basically out of the country. The CIA people were real. The military people were real. The ambassador, his relationship to the ambassador, as Richard told me, was based on truth. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the ambassador is based on, on uh, 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 Ambassador White at that time, who was a, a deeply divided man, uh, a so-called you know American liberal, trying to be a liberal, and when the Pentagon is trying to tell him to uh, to uh, you know tighten up. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, I mean, I think we showed that essential split in our government apparatus between the State Department and the Defense Department. Uh, what isn't true, I mean, I did cram a lot of facts. I mean, I didn't think that there was going to be any other picture made about that subject. So, obviously, I tried to do two years of in, in uh, two hours. Mm. Uh, I went to all the way up to the election of 1982, that election scene, you know, when they talk about democracy and the lack of it. Mm -hmm. And why, you know, you have to vote and all those questions that were raised. Right. Uh, that was the last thing we covered in 82. Boyle was not actually there when Romero was killed, but I don't think I violated the spirit of it. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a huge stampede when he was killed. Forty people were trampled to death, killed by sniper fire. That was never proven from a rooftop. Uh, that was at his funeral, but not at his assassination. So what I did is I combined the assassination and the funeral. Right. Uh, but he was killed in giving mass. Um, the nuns, uh, Richard knew one of the nuns, uh, Kathy, uh, Jeannie Donovan, who was killed. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think that I violated the spirit. I mean, if you did pick, I guess you could say I did. Mm. I, I feel like we kept to the spirit of the time. Mm. Mm. What does Richard Boyle think of the film? I think he's quite taken by it. <laughs> he wants to be a movie star. <laughs> uh, he doesn't have any role in it, does he, or does he? He was cut out. No, he did have a small role as a journalist. Right. But uh, he loves it, and uh, he's, uh, you know, uh, basically up to his evil, uh, up to his bad ways again. Is he? <laughs> Womanizing and stuff, but, uh, trying to make another deal. Is he um, still covering Central America? Uh, not, not now. No, he's, uh, he, uh, I think that in, in I, I, let me just say, I think the character in the movie is probably a little bit better in real, in, than the real life person. Oh? I mean, in terms of his redemption and, uh, his caring. I mean, given that he was that, or is that sort of a man, I mean, how much could you trust what he was able to tell you? I know Richard for six, seven years, and he's Irish, and I, and I know how to discount some of the blarney. <laughs> uh, I mean, I sat with him for, you know, for we sat in a room, and we went to Salvador together. I mean, you sit with a man, and you, you know, you, you, you write it with him, and you, you know what's... It, the details are too accurate in spots. I mean, things people remember mm. about a scene, you know, and it gives it away. Mm. Mm. I, I go by that. I go by my what my eyes tell me. Right. Uh, you said that you didn't think another film would be made about this subject. So, in, in essence, this is really uh, your statement about uh, American military imperialism uh, in Central America. I, ha I think it'll have to do for now. <laughs> no, but I mean, that's what you set out to make. No, I set out to do a story of Richard Boyle, mm. uh, who was an interesting character. And, uh, and uh, I wanted to do a story about a journalist who's a pain in the neck and a gadfly based on his character, which is outrageous. Uh, Richard's covered a lot of different situations in Ireland, in Lebanon, in uh, Afghanistan, in Cambodia. Mm. Uh, we, we, I mean, I was looking to do something, and it ultimately settled on Salvador, of which I knew nothing. So mm. I really was not coming to this uh, with a set point of view. I really didn't know the situation there until I went there with Richard, read up on it, researched it, and got involved. So I didn't set out to do that. But you must have had a fair inkling, I mean, particularly given your Vietnam experience. It's, you know, it's, it's something that you can say that in hindsight. But when you, I mean, I went into the situation really without an axe to grind. I mm. didn't know from the newspapers who the bad guys were and who the good guys were. Mm. It's hard to tell unless you really were there. Mm. 
And now who do you think the good guys are? Well, I mean, as the film tells you, I mean, I think that the death squads are an abomination. I think the, uh, the military down there is totally corrupt from head to toe and is evil. And it's not just right wing, it's, it's, uh, it's middle, the, the middle government. The civilian government, I think, is really weak and is being propped up uh, basically by American support. Uh, the only viable alternative that I can see is a total revolution. Mm. But, but will that bring to power a communist rule? Possibly. They call themselves whatever they call themselves. Mm. Mm. Um, can, can we just uh, can I just go back a bit uh, we, we left off uh, and jumped into this before I'd sort of got a little bit further ahead in your own career um, what, what, I, what is your full list of credits then sort of in chronological order you you, um, you said two of those 12 films were produced there was the seizure one and then the, the 12th one what happened after that oh uh, Midnight Express was written and uh, produced Midnight Express was written and produced and then after that? Uh, uh, after that, um, uh, I wrote and directed a film called The Hand. Right, I remember that, yep. And, and I uh, did a picture called, uh, I, I co-wrote Conan the Barbarian. And then I wrote uh, Scarface. I co-wrote uh, You're the Dragon. That's right, yep. And then I did Salvador and I just finished my two. Right, okay, so we haven't really missed anything. That's what I was worried about. No, okay, fine. Well, just going back to, uh, to Midnight Express, wh how did you connect then with, um, uh, with Alan Parker? That was done through uh, Columbia. They had this book they wanted to make, put me together with a young director they didn't really have much faith in either. I think David Putnam was more important to, their, to the deal, probably, right. uh, at that time. And uh, I wrote the script in London. Uh, and they essentially shot the script. They, there was very few changes made. Because mm. mm. uh, Alan Park has become uh, sort of a friend over the years. I've, you know, he's come down here a bit, quite a bit, and I've seen him in uh, Cannes and, and London. And in fact, I, uh, I, on my way back through uh, America about five or six weeks ago, I was down in New Orleans on his uh, his current film, uh, Angel Heart, with Robert De Niro and Mickey Rourke. Uh -huh. So uh, if, if you see him, uh, just say hi to him for me. All righty. <laughs> he's a great guy. I really like him. Yeah. I haven't seen him in years, actually. Haven't you? No. Oh, really? We sort of gone our different ways. You know? uh, yeah, I, I I like him. He's got a he's got a real sort of rebellious streak in him. Yes, he does. Yeah. In, in terms of the industry and so on. Yeah, he's a bit like me. Right. Absolutely. Now, uh, having made this film and, and now made Platoon, uh, are you um, are you any closer or uh, or any further away from uh, from Hollywood? No, actually, Salvador helped. <laughs> I've been offered enormous, great big stuff. I've been offered, uh, you know, by all the people who turned me down. Not all, but I mean, a lot of them, yeah. Ironic, it's, that isn't it? It's funny the way the word turns. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so Platoon is what is, is uh, based on your experiences in Vietnam. Right. Okay, um, can you give me, without giving the, the entire story away, just a little bit about the, the story of the film? Well, it deals with the uh, inf uh, with the basic uh, infantry unit, the platoon, 30 guys, four platoons in a company. And it's a story of a young man uh, who comes to uh, this war as a new recruit, I mean, new in the jungle, and he uh, learns the law of the bush, the law of the jungle. And uh, it's about his growth and uh, as a human being and his coming uh, to a manhood that he never thought he would uh, ever get to. Uh, it involves also uh, uh, a uh, Captain Ahab type character who's a sergeant who, uh, uh, whose uh, obsession in life is the destruction of the uh, of the uh, gooks, as as uh, the white boy home was, the, was Ahab's obsession, and a counterforce in, in another sergeant who uh, puts who uh, takes him on. Right. Our boy witnesses it and has to take sides. And I won't tell you what happens after that. Right, that's uh, well put. Um, who are the leads in the film? Uh, Charlie Sheen plays uh, the boy. Right. He's, very, he's 20 years old. And uh, Willem Dafoe, who is in To Live and Die in L.A., mm -hmm. plays uh, the good sergeant. 
Tom Berenger. Uh, plays the, uh, the obsessed sergeant. Mm. And with, just to refresh my memory, uh, what, what were the problems that you ran into over there? Philippines, the revolution. Oh, that's right. You were, you were shooting when it was all on. That's right. Because yeah. I sort of was hearing stories, I think, at the Cannes Film Festival about, uh, about all of this. Yeah. <laughs> we had to rearrange our schedule somewhat. We had to deal with the military changes because we were dependent on military supplies as we were, you know, in the Salvador situation. Mm. We had a lot of helicopters and infantry battalions. We had to make new deals. Uh, with new generals, <laughs> but uh, and that and the problems of the monsoon, which were which was encroaching, were keeping us on our toes. But we got out of there pretty fast. We got in and out, unlike Coppola, in about three months. Right. Which was lucky. Did uh, did, th did that military changeover or the build up to it, um, in fact, cause you any real problems at all? Not in only in money terms. Some changes, some overpayments, some different payments. Uh, some under the table payments, if you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And I think it hurt us more in psychological terms because I think we lost about five actors at the last second who did not want to come over. Mm. And their agents, you know, pulled them out of the movie. Mm. And any of the leads? No, none of the leads, uh, but the uh, higher ups. And, uh, you know, mother's calling me, can my son go over there? Because these kids are 19, 18. Mm. Yeah. Of course, Platoon went on to win four Academy Awards, including a Best Director Oscar for Oliver, and he was also nominated for Best Original Screenplay. Oliver is 76 now and still writing and directing. His next film is expected to be White Lies, starring Benicio del Toro.